If you join me in standing as we read Hebrews 12, verses 18 through 29, it's on page 1206 in your, in your pew Bibles. Hebrews 12, verse 18. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet, and the sound of words which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command. If even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of great created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude, by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let's pray together this morning. Father, as we stand before you, uh, we are reminded, as we just heard, of your holiness. Help us today to grasp what that means. Amen. You may be seated. A few years ago, I remember having a conversation with a, a colleague, it went something like this. It started with the question, what do you think is God's primary attribute? What is his number one attribute? And my, my colleague, his answer was, was love. God's primary attribute is love. And in fact, Scripture tells us that, right? God is love. And uh, I agree. God's Love is the definition of the word, unlike uh, how we as human beings tend to define it. But my answer was different, and I hope this morning to just kind of start our time off with that argument and explaining why I think God's primary attribute is not love, but instead is His holiness. God's primary attribute is His holiness, His otherness, His different than everyone else, every other God created by man and every other man created by God. He is altogether different and higher and better and just there's no other word to define it by except for that He is holy. He is different. He is set apart. The reason why I believe that this is his primary attribute is that because of his holiness, all of his other attributes are, are, are lived out by our God in the way that only he can live them out. So, for instance, if we would say love, well, without God's holiness, his love would be much like ours. It would be self-serving. It may grow cold. In other words, it would be a human-like love, and that is the way that humans love. They love in ways that are self-serving, and their love can grow cold unless there is something different in them, namely the holiness of, of a holy God in their lives. But God's love rather endures forever. In fact, 
this whole point about how God loves versus how humanity loves and, and the determining factor being his holiness, Jesus made this case, right? He told uh, the, the people there in Matthew 5, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even the tax collectors do that. And he finished up that passage there in, in Matthew 5, 43 to 48 by saying, therefore be perfect, be complete, be fully mature, maybe even something as a synonym, be holy, even as God is holy. God's holiness is what makes his love, love, and what it is. Without holiness, God's wrath would be petty and vengeful rather than just. But because God is holy and because God is loving, he has a just wrath, a righteousness that we crave. Now, people struggle with this. You mean God lets people go to hell? Yes. He punishes injustice. He punishes sin. And while we would want grace ourselves, we only have to have something difficult happen to us from someone else for us to see how humanity handles wrath and anger. We don't want a wrathful God, but when someone harms us, we want justice and probably sometimes even revenge. And if God did not have his holiness, he would be wrathful and vengeful and not just but he is holy, and so even his wrath is good and right and just. Without God's holiness, his power would be self-serving and unchecked by mercy. The reality is we would all be destroyed. He destroyed the earth once with a flood. He's promised that there will be a day coming where justice will be meted out, but we know that in the meantime, he has extended grace to those who have lived in rebellion against him. He has the power to snuff us out in an instant. And yet, because of his holiness, which informs his love and his just wrath, he also has a mercy that keeps that power from, from annihilating us. Without holiness, I would say that God's wisdom and knowledge would simply be proud and condescending. How do I know that? That's because that's how we fashioned uh, the gods as humanity that we've created. Oftentimes, those gods you read about in mythology, they're proud, they're arrogant, their wisdom, they scoff at humanity. God, rather, in his wisdom, is generous. James tells us that he gives wisdom liberally, lavishly to those who ask for it. Yes, God is different than us. God is holy. And that truth for some of us should be a terrible truth. And for some of us, it should be an all-consuming comfort and joy. We are not like God. And this is bad news for those who reject Him, but it's good news for those who place their trust in Jesus, the better high priest the better sacrifice, the better mediator of a better covenant. So over the past few months now, we have been walking through Hebrews, and we should by this time remember that the focus and argument of the writer of Hebrews is being made that you Hebrew believers, you Jewish believers who are tempted to turn away from Christ and return to the old covenant and the old ways of Judaism because it will make things easier for you living in the Roman Empire. If you do that, you will be trampling the blood of Christ and rejecting his better sacrifice by which you've obtained eternal salvation. They'll be making the same mistake as Esau, we heard last week, who despised and thought so little of the blessings that were his as the firstborn that he traded his birthright for a bowl of soup. Now, believe it or not, I like a good soup. But it's not worth that. He thought so little of his position as firstborn that he would trade it to quench his hunger for a moment. So then, we would be making that, make, that same mistake if we reject Jesus and all that is ours 
in him. It would be to profane his name and to despise his work and to forfeit our inheritance in him. So chapter 12, the writer of Hebrews has been making sort of a final argument. He's going to restate again, closing comments uh, today before he goes into chapter 13 as we have it, where he makes application on Christian living. But for one last time, as is the, the rabbinical nature to continue coming back around, he's going to come back around one more time just to lay out for us again who God is, who Christ is, what we have in Him, and what we forfeit should we go backwards to the old ways. So he's encouraged the reader to run this race with endurance, and we'll hear this final word again that one day we're going to stand before a holy God, either in Christ or apart from Christ. Now, in our own history uh, as the United States, there was a message. My message title today is Sinners in the Hands of a Holy God. In our own history as the United States, there was a message much like this one preached by a, a man named Jonathan Edwards, His was entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And I would say that angry God is the holy God. And Edwards uh, and his message resulted in what we know as the first great awakening in the United States. Now, I am no Jonathan Edwards. I don't have buckles on my shoes, for one. But uh, I hope that today uh, we will be challenged to take stock of our current reality and our eternal position before a holy God. I hope and I pray that this message for some of us will cause us to come to the Lord in repentance as needed, and that we also will be encouraged and emboldened to run the race of faith well with endurance. So before we jump in, I just want to ask this question. What might God do in and through us if we respond in such a manner to this holy God? We'll begin with verse 18. The writer of Hebrews, having just pointed out to us the folly of Esau, continues in this way. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness, and gloom, and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet, and to the sound of words which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For if they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. The writer of Hebrews reminds them once more of the ways of the old covenant. And in these verses, 18 through 21, we see the weight of a holy God. Something that cannot be borne by humanity in and of themselves. He points us back to Mount Sinai the mountain of God in the Old Covenant. We read this passage that he's referring to in Exodus 19, where in the past, the holiness of God stood as a barrier to his people. He's brought them out of Egypt. He's giving them the law, literally giving them the covenant of law. And this is what it says in Exodus 19. It says, The Lord also said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments become ceremonially clean and pure. And let them be ready for the third day, for on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You should set bounds or barriers for the people all around saying, beware that you do not go up to the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. God visiting his people, coming down on the mountain, Mount Sinai, to deliver to them the covenant of his law. 
And because God was holy, and even though they spent three days preparing to be holy, and they come before him, because of his holiness, they cannot approach even the mountain of God. If they do, they will be put to death. And you notice, it's not just them. Even if a a beast, an animal, approaches too close, it must be put to death. Because even an innocent animal who does not know right from wrong, has no ability to sin or do righteousness, is still unclean in the presence of the holy, righteous God. That's heavy. Do we really know who God is? The answer to that question is no. Even as I'm preparing a message, even as we're hearing God's word, even as we're reading it, We do not understand who he is. The holiness of a righteous God that is so pure that should we approach him, all of our our wickedness would come to the forefront and all of our sin would declare us unholy and we would be undone. The people could not bear even the presence of God. He sets up barriers and says, you can come this close. And even then, they can't stand it. The the writer says they couldn't bear the command. If even a beast touches the mountain, it'll be stoned. And Moses is afraid of God himself. Moses, the lawgiver, one of the patriarchs, one of the Hebrews' uh, uh, heroes. I was trying to say the heroes of the Hebrews, but Hebrews' heroes. He was undone with fear and trembled because of the holiness of God in the presence of his people. They were not only instructed to remain at that safe distance on pain of death, but they couldn't even bear it at that safe distance. They were afraid because just like Adam and Eve, who hid in their sinful state, They were exposed and their unholiness is laid bare. And this is a consistent and fitting response to God. It's not just here in Exodus. It wasn't just in the garden when sin entered the world. We see it all through Scripture. Isaiah in chapter 6, when he sees the Lord high and lifted up, he falls on his face and exclaims, Woe is me, for I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. Because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, when he encounters the holy God, he falls flat on his face because he is overwhelmingly understanding in that moment of who he is and who God is. In 1 Samuel 6, the men of Beth Shemesh, they looked into the ark of God and God killed 50,070 of them. And their response was, who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? Elijah, he hides his face at simply a gentle breeze, which is God's presence. John, in Revelation, at the presence of God the Son, says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. Make no mistake, God is holy and man is not. Contrary to what people want to believe, People are not basically good. No one is good, Jesus said, but God. We have this concept in our fallen state as humanity and in our culture that everybody's basically good. It's just stuff that happens to them that makes them evil. That's not what Scripture teaches us. David said, in sin I was conceived. We are brought forth in sin, and that is our natural state, and evil is our natural desire, and rebellion against God is what we live for as we build ourselves up to be the object of our own worship, unless something changes. We are not holy or able to be in God's presence and live. We cannot be good enough to stand before him and live. He is good, but he is not safe for us. This is the reality even here for God's covenant people in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant. 
sacrifice and purity rituals that were required for even the holiest, that, that priest who entered once a year were not enough. And so even after all of that, that high priest would enter in fear of his life, should he not be deemed worthy. There is a weight when it comes to the holiness of God. And for anyone who is not in Christ, you should be afraid because he is good and you are not. And he is just and his wrath will be poured out on you. Oh, but it's good news that God is holy in this way. For those who are in Christ, we don't have to feel the weight of his holiness in that same way. We certainly feel it. We understand of who, who we are in and of ourselves, but we have good news, and we receive not the weight of God's holiness, but the welcome of a holy God. Look at verses 22 through 24. But you, reader of Hebrews, and those of us here today as well, you, if you are in Christ You're not at Mount Sinai where you have to fear and tremble, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God and the heavenly Jerusalem and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. While there is a weight to God's holiness, and for those who are not in Christ, they should feel that and should tremble, we receive the welcome of a holy God. This Mount Zion, this is the new Jerusalem, the new mountain of God, the city of God. We, we see this here in Revelation 21. We, we see a, a description of it from John. And he says this in verses 2 through 4 of Revelation 21. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God, is among men. Is that not what we've been talking about? And he will dwell among them. God with us, not separated from him any longer. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, and there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Oh, we have a welcome to the city of God, the holy God, who welcomes us to himself. Those who are in Christ are welcome to this new city, to this new existence where all the pains and all the results of sin entering the world and the unholiness of humanity are done away with. We are enrolled as the firstborn. What does that mean? Uh, Israel was referred to as the firstborn of God. And so those who are in Christ are the firstborn of God, enrolled and brought in as citizens of this new city. We join with the angels arrayed and ready for the festivities of worship to this holy God. We are those who have received the blessing and birthright in Christ that Esau detested. We are the righteous who are made perfect. Who are those that are referred to there? The righteous made perfect. It's those great cloud of witnesses that we've read about who have gone before us. We are welcomed into their presence as they stand by, encouraging us to run the race, cheering us on, so to speak. We are going to be with them if we endure to the end, welcomed along with them, all saved by the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. And we're invited into the presence of Jesus himself, the mediator who has made the way. This past week, again, I saw a picture of, uh, of, it was shared by someone who had lost a child this year, and the picture is called First Day in Heaven. Has anyone seen this? And it's just a picture of a young lady with her arms just wrapped around Jesus. All the pain and hurt and suffering that sin has caused in this world, done away with. If you're in Christ, this holy God who is terrifying welcomes you as children to the sprinkled blood of Christ, 
that once for all sacrifice. Abel, as we talked about in chapter 11, his sacrifice was, was acceptable to God because it was looking forward in faith, knowing that blood was required for forgiveness. And he saw into the future. He didn't understand it, but he was placing his trust in the one who would come. This blood is better than Abel's because it's the realization and the fulfillment of that promise once for all. From the sins of Cain, had he repented, the sins of Adam and Eve, all the way through the last sin that will happen before Christ returns, covered by the blood of Christ. And so we are welcomed. Those who run the race well don't need to fear God in the way that those who don't know him do. In Christ, they've been made righteous already through him. They stand complete in him. They're not in danger of destruction, but they are received as dearly loved children. Now, this is that whole thing that we see through the New Testament, this already not yet concept. The things that are accomplished in Christ are done, it is finished, and yet we have not fully experienced them yet. We haven't fully experienced this face-to-face reality that Calvary brought to us. And so the reader, readers of Hebrews and, and us as well, we are as believers encouraged to be holy. Hebrews 12, 14 tells us that, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. That word sanctification is the same idea as holiness. Be holy. How do we be holy? (laughs) We place our trust in Christ Jesus and we pursue this holiness through obedience to him. We are encouraged by Peter to make our calling and election sure. We are encouraged by Paul and Philippians to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We are essentially what the writer of Hebrews said, called to run the race. It takes effort to run the race. You can't stand at the starting line, hear the gun go off, and say, Jesus, move me to the finish. It doesn't work that way. We have to run the race, but we run the race in the spirit and in the power of the holy God who welcomes us. He empowers us to live in this way and to pursue him and to live at peace with all people. It is the work of God which supplies all of our ability, and he will see this through to completion. Philippians 1, 6, he who began this good work in you will be faithful to complete it. And in Christ, as we run this race with endurance, we no longer are those who stand far away from Mount Sinai and tremble, but we come near to our Father, welcomed by a holy God. Now, as the writer of Hebrews is want and accustomed to doing, he gives us one more warning. We've been talking about the warnings, and this is the last one in the book. Verse 25, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. It's the thesis of the book again. It's the word of a holy God. It's a promise from the holy God. The warning of the Holy God is where we should be, number three. The warning of the Holy God, unless I mess something up, okay. And so this warning remains. What is this warning? What is he talking about? Well, it's the basic warning of the whole book. Don't go back. Continue forward with Christ. Endure. But what is the the escape that they were not used. When they refused him, it says, they did not escape who warned them on earth. What's he talking about? Let's go back again to the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 28. Now, I'm not doing all of this because 15 to 68 is a lot of verses. But what we find there is a list of curses that God gave to the Israelites when he established the covenant of law with them. He gave them all the things that would be blessings should they follow him, but he also gave them a list of curses that would happen if they did not remain true to him, if they would reject him. So what he's saying here is just like the people of Israel were not spared 
when they turn from me, don't think you will be either. What are these curses? In verse uh, 15 of Deuteronomy 28, he says, but it shall come about if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe, to do all the commandments and his statutes, which I charge you today, that all these curses will come on you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, cursed you, shall you be in the country, cursed shall, you be, uh, shall be your basket and your kneading bowl, cursed shall be the offspring of your body and the produce of your ground, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Cursed shall be you when you come in and cursed shall you be you when you go out. Basically, no matter where you are or what you're doing, it's going to be bad for you. The wrath of a holy God will discipline you. If we were to go on throughout that, uh, you would read all of these. I'm just going to give us a quick list that we find in the remaining verses there. Defeat in battle. You'll be defeated in battle. Your efforts, whatever they are, are going to be thwarted. You'll suffer fever and pestilence. You'll suffer death and drought. Your bodies will be fed on by the wildlife in the fields. You'll, you'll understand and, and receive and, and experience the plagues like Egypt did. You'll have blindness and madness. Your wives will be violated. Your children will be carried off as slaves. Crops will be destroyed by locusts. These are just a few of the curses. And so he finishes, he didn't finish, but I'm going to finish with verses 45 and 40, 46. So all these curses shall come on you and pursue you and overtake you until you're destroyed because you would not obey the Lord your God by keeping his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded you. They shall become a sign and a wonder on you and your descendants forever. These are the curses. This is what was being meted out to God's unfaithful people under the old covenant. And the writer of Hebrews is simply saying, should you choose to go back to that covenant, that's what you have to look forward to. Because if they did not listen to the one speaking to them on the earth, which would be even Moses giving them the law from the Lord, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. Who is he who warn, warns from heaven? It's God himself. It's God the Son. It's Jesus should you not listen to him, should you reject him, you too will receive the curses of God. If God did not withhold these from his covenant children, how much more will he withhold these from those who have heard the one who warns from heaven and reject him? And that is Jesus. Remember right at the beginning of Hebrews 1-2, God spoke to us in his Son. So should you choose to turn back from Jesus, all of the curses of the old covenant will be your reward. That's pretty heavy too. But there is a word of a holy God. There is a promise that he's given us as well. Verses 26 and 27. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yes, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. What do we make of this? It's a promise of a coming judgment. Well, how's that good news? How does that bounce back from the warning? Well, it isn't good news for those who reject him. What's he talking about here? Back on Sinai there in Exodus that we read earlier, God's voice boomed. <laughs> it shook the earth. People couldn't stand it. But what the writer of Hebrews is also referring to is the prophet Haggai, who in Haggai 2.6 says this, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more, so I did it once on Sinai, once more in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of all nations, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Now, at the immediate, he was talking about rebuilding the temple, but what is the temple that will not end? It is Christ. It is the new Jerusalem. It is him. It is his presence. It is the coming king. It is the day of judgment coming. Second Peter, in Second Peter, Peter uh, reflects this passage from Haggai and what the writer of Hebrews is saying here in Second Peter 3. He says this, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar. Uh, they'll be shaken. 
And the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and goodness, looking for and hastening to the coming day of the God, because which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. It's the promise of the welcome of the Holy Spirit. God for those who are in Christ. There's a promise. I will shake the earth once more, and not only the earth, but the heavens, all of creation itself will experience the day of judgment coming. God, after all, is the judge of all. We saw that in verse 23, talking about going to the new Jerusalem. He's going to shake it again. It reminds me of Psalm 1. There is this way, and anybody ever been, a few years ago, my family took me on my birthday because it's where I really wanted to go, to a, a cave complex in Wisconsin. Can't think of anywhere better to go on your birthday. And while we were there, they had a panning situation where you could get a little, you know what I'm talking about? You get a little little pan there, it's got, a, it's got some mesh in the bottom, and you, you pan for gold, and nobody ever found any. But it sifted out all the, all the other things. Or maybe you have the idea, or you think about threshing, which is where I was going with first, uh, with Psalm 1, threshing where they would take all of the, the, the grain that was harvested, and they would toss it in the air, and as they did that, the chaff, the husk, all the things around the actual seed would blow away in the wind. And so, yes, Psalm 1, 4, the wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. When the day of the Lord comes, everything will be shaken, and that which remains will be true and good and unmovable, but that which is wicked and unholy and unrighteous will be blown away. That which remains is that which is enduring and eternal. So God is this judge, and the day of the Lord is coming, and this is a promise that the Lord will keep his word. To those who have built on sand of their own wisdom and goodness, they're going to be destroyed. Their house, as it were, will fall flat. But those who are in Christ who build on the rock, who place their trust in him, even with this shaking, will remain and stand firm. His kingdom will stand and endure. It is forever, and it will not be shaken. So, there is a weight of a holy God. Who can stand before him? Only those who are standing in Christ Jesus. And if we are, then we are welcomed by this holy God as dearly loved children. He gives that warning again. Don't turn back, but instead proceed forward. And when the day of the Lord comes and all is shaken, if you are in him, you will stand firm. And so then what is the fitting response to this? This good news for those of us who are in Christ, it's worship. It is the worship of the holy God that we arrive at. Verse 28, therefore, everything I've said so far, the old covenant and how it can't save, the new covenant and how it does, the warnings against falling away, but the blessings that come with remaining firm in him when he comes and establishes his unshakable kingdom. Therefore, because all of this, since we have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This is a picture of worship of the holy God. It is the eternal, eternal, unshakable joy of the redeemed. The fitting response is worship. There is gratitude, as it says there, which is thanksgiving. Would we not give thanks to a holy God who condescended to send his only son to give his righteous life for us? 
Does that not inspire gratitude in you? Oh, it should. Thanksgiving and faithfulness. A life lived faithfully like those in Hebrews 11 who received from God their reward for their faithful living. This acceptable service which is pleasing to God. Offer your bodies as sacrifices, Romans 12 says. Why? So that you may know his good and pleasing will, what God desires. And so as we live in response to that, we live out faithfulness through acceptable servants, acceptable service. And then to be overwhelmed by his grace, the response of reverence and awe. There is an awesomeness of God that is fear, and there is an awesomeness of God that is reverence and holy fear and wonder. Not fear that trembles because we fear that we will be destroyed, but a fear that says, you are holy, I am not, and you have saved me? (laughs) Worshiping an awesome, holy God. Because our God is a consuming fire. When that day of shaking comes, all that is unholy, all that is unrighteous, all that stands in opposition to him and his kingdom will be burned away. And we ourselves will finally be made complete and pure as he refines us and purifies us and perfects us for all of eternity. We will be presented pure and righteous. All of our sin nature, all of our own misgivings, all of our own disobedience will finally be removed. We stand now complete in Christ and His holiness. Then that consuming fire will remove every blot and stain from us. Our sins will be white as snow. Already the case, not yet the case, one day will be realized completely. Those that are His will never lose Him. They have an eternal security, shall we say. They will have an eternal joy. They will have an eternal fellowship with him. Revelation 21, back to there, verses 5 through 7, it says this, And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, Write for these words are faithful and true. And then he said, It is done. It is done. Jesus has accomplished all. All of this, all of these promises are yes in him. It is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. And he who overcomes will inherit these things. And I will be his God and he will be my son. We receive the benefits, the blessings, the birthright of the children of God, of the Son of God himself. And so this then, this holy God who stands as a terrifying trial to those who are not righteous but should be a comfort to us is good news. If you are feeling pressure to turn away, endure because your reward is assured in Christ Jesus. You will receive and inherit these things. If you run the race and if you endure, you will receive the crown of life. The chief end of man, according to the Westminster Confession, is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And this is what was described in Psalm 145, our call to worship this morning. Verses 1 and 2 I'll remind you of. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. Already, not yet, as I consider you as a holy God while I'm living on this earth, even in the trials and the hardships I face, even in my own failures because of Christ, I stand complete in you and I praise you now every day in the way I live. I desire you more. And one day I will see you, I will stand with that throng before the throne, and we will worship the God, the Lamb, who is to be worshipped, who is holy forever and ever and ever and ever. And i got to tell you, if that doesn't get you excited 
Two things are going on. One of two. You either don't understand who you are and who he is, or you may not be standing complete in him. Do we understand who God is? No, we don't. But when we see glimpses and we see the reality of who we are, how can we do anything other than worship him? And say thank you. And give our life and our all. If you're in Christ, God is making all things new. This earth will pass away with all of its trials and its hardships. Every tear will be wiped away. He's making all things new. And you will receive a crown of life. All the blessings of this life, life abundantly, as Jesus said it, are yours. All the promises of God are yes and ours in Christ Jesus. In other words, the blessings that God bestows upon his son are yours in Christ Jesus. Why would we not worship? So let us then not turn back. But since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run with endurance the race laid before us. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, let us press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. Why would we do this? Because as we see here, to sum it all up in one run-on sentence, very Pauline, we have confidence that the blood of Christ protects or perfects those who endure so that when we come face to face with a holy God we will experience eternal unshakable joy do we understand who he is do we understand who we are do we understand who we are if we are not in Christ do we understand who we are if we stand made complete in him. We are sinners in the hands of a holy God. What determines what that means for us is have we turned away from Christ or do we run to him? Father, this morning, I pray that we would be just reminded again that we would consider who we are whose we are, how we stand before a holy God. And God, if we are in a position where we are not yours and we are not trusting you, may we today, through the power and grace of your Spirit, repent of our sin, turn away and walk with you and run towards you and endure running this race to the end. Lord Jesus, if we have done that, if we are standing in you complete, may we be overwhelmed by a sense of our still own unrighteousness, but overwhelmed by the grace of your goodness and your righteousness that completes us and saves us and keeps us. And Lord, may we be a people who, overwhelmed by such things, respond in worship not just with our mouths, but with our lives. And may we look forward to the day when we will stand before you and glorify you already, but then forever and ever to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be glory and honor and power forever and ever and ever. Amen.